Gluten Morgan everyone, we are ending this 2022, about to start 2023. And this was a wonderful year. I've been traveling around the world like I've never done with my sourdough starter always. This year we have arrived to Barcelona and now I have a Gluten Morgan Lab in Barcelona too. Yeah, I never thought about that. And now I have a Gluten Morgan Lab Barcelona. You should visit it soon. There we visit a lot of bakers, a lot of friends, such as Richard Bertinet, Dan Lepar, Fernando Troca, Daniel Jordá, and many others. And this year I also traveled to Uruguay, Chile, and even Panama. Yes, I visited there an Austrian bakery. Yes, in Panama. Beautiful. And this year we also started our podcast. Yes, with Dan Lepar, Richard Bertinet, and even me. <laughs> so thank you for being part of Luton Morgan TV. And I hope this new year, this 2023, will be full of gluten for everyone. Hi, my name is Gluten Morgan. I am here to help you bake every day better. Today I will show you how to build this sourdough starter without blowing your mind. It's very easy and very simple. The first thing that we need to do is to put just one, two, or three spoons of flour, whichever flour. If you have white flour, it's okay. If you have whole wheat flour, it's okay. Rye flour, whichever you have at home. And as I told you before, we're going to do it by the eye. Forget the measurements, forget weighting things, nothing. It's very, very simple. So, okay, we have the flour, which is the other ingredient that we need. Water. Water gives life. Okay. And now I'm going to mix it. And, and this is the only thing that we have to do. Mix these two ingredients and check the texture. This is the texture that I'm looking for. But why? The theory says that you have to have equal parts of flour and water that's a hydration of 100 percent okay but when we are doing it by the eye what we're looking for is to lower this hydration just looking for this texture and that is very very easy to obtain so this is the key to succeed on this and this is day one what is going on inside this jar here we have two sides on our left side we have the wild yeast and on the right side, we have the lactobacteria. And both, in sort of way, they hate each other. The yeast produce alcohol and the lactobacteria produce acid. And they don't like much what the other one uh, does. So what we have to do is to make them work together and be friends, that's what we're looking for. And how we do it? With the right amount, the right texture, there, as I told you, and also it's very important, the temperature. The temperature is also very important. 25 degrees centigrade would be the best. Here you can see it also in Fahrenheit, okay? So what we need is to feed this starter every day and to leave this, mm, this project at room temperature 25 degrees centigrade. That's the key to succeed on building a sourdough starter from scratch. If you're in a colder place and you need to warm it up, you could use your Wi-Fi router and you put it on the Wi-Fi router and it will help you to give the temperature that you need. You can also use a bowl with some warm water inside. There are a lot of things that you could do. And on the other side, if you are in a, in a tropical place, very hot place, you could use some cold water, maybe in a cellar. You need to find a way to obtain this 25 degrees. That's very, very important. So let's move on to second day. Day two. What's going on here? Much nothing. <laughs> it's just by the moment you don't see any activity at all. They're just getting along, knowing each other, trying to work together, these both sides that I told you before. So, what do we have to do now? Nothing, feed it. How? With, again, flour and more water. And always looking to get the same texture as the day before. So, I take again the same flour, 
I put one or two more spoons of flour and some water. Always by the eye. And maybe you're asking yourself, don't you discard a part? No, you don't need, because we're doing very small amount in this jar. There's no need to discard any part of this project by the moment, okay? So, I have already fit it, and now I just mix it all again and look again for this texture. If it's a little bit liquid, oh, there's no problem. What do I do? Just a little bit, a little bit more flour, and that's the solution. It's always by the eye. Forget everything that you've learned before. This is very, very simple. Now, that's the texture that I'm looking for. Not too dry, not too liquid. It's okay. And that's all we have to do on day two. Now, I cover it up and leave it here on the counter till tomorrow and remember the temperature. Very, very important, always 25 degrees centigrade here in Fahrenheit. And what is going to happen from now on? Okay, this will depend a little bit on your environment. So, to get the sourdough starter ready, it could take you from four to maybe seven days. So, what we have to do every day, the same thing that you saw just a moment ago, Feed it. Every day feed your starter with a little bit of flour, some water and in a warm environment. Okay, that's the key to get this thing working. So I'll see you in three more days. And look at it. We've made it. This is our sourdough starter made by scratch and very, very easy without blowing your mind. <laughs> okay, let's check it out. Wow. Wow, super bubbly, all filled with air. This means that there's a serious and good fermentation going on inside here. Finally, this both sides, the yeast and the lactobacteria are working together. Mm, and that is also characteristic of the sourdough starter. The sour smell, the acidic smell. It smells maybe like yogurt, like cheese, like milk. But it's okay. That's the way it should smell. Check the texture. It's all bubbly and full of air. Can you hear it? Wow. Ooh. <laughs> That's all the air from the fermentation. So now we are ready to start baking our own sourdough bread at home. There's nothing better than this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. Wow. wow. Ooh. I think it's ready to start baking bread. So in this bowl I have the flour and I will add the semolina. Now I will add the sourdough starter. Remember, you can also see in the description of this video all the ingredients with grams. Sourdough starter and water. Remember, salt in a few minutes. I like to work in a bowl because it's much easier than working on the counter. It's, it's also cleaner. And if you want to move around your house, you can do it. You see, it's very easy. Check this out. I am not kneading at all. I am just mixing all the ingredients, not the salt, remember. Just mixing, no kneading. Why? Because I'll take advantage of the well-known or maybe not yet known autolysis. Check if there's no more dry flour and that's all. That's all the no kneading that we're doing, okay? So now begins the autolysis. I'll cover the bowl and leave it here on the counter for around one hour, maybe two hours, and you'll see the results. Okay, we have to wait an hour. No! Gluten has always prepared on behalf. And take a look now and see how our dough has changed. It is almost kneaded. 
by itself. That's called autolysis. I wash my hands, just put a little bit of water on my hands, and look, look how the gluten has developed, and this dough is almost kneaded without the need of doing nothing, only waiting. Just it's about time. Take a look. That's very important. We have our dough ready. What else do we need? Our last ingredient, remember the salt? Okay, so now I add the salt and I'll mix it again. It's shiny, bold and smooth, very smooth. So we're done with the kneading. What do we have to do now? We have to wait. It's almost about time and waiting when you bake sourdough bread. And now I'll cover it up again and now we have to let it rise. It has to double its volume. This is called first fermentation or bulk fermentation, which is inside a bowl. And if we are doing the things right and the sourdough starter was very active, this would take us about like four hours, okay? So let's wait for it. And thanks to the gluten video edition, we don't have to wait that much. See how the dough has risen, it is full of air, full of bubbles inside. And that is going to be our crumb. So we don't have to degas it, we don't have to press it, we just work with it very gently, okay? So here I have the dough, and what do I have to do? I need to put it on the counter. Just a semolina on the counter, a little bit on my hands. I could also use some oil, but I don't like that much. So, see how full of air. You should do this very carefully. Please don't degas this dough. We've been working hard to get this dough, so we don't want to degas it. Okay, here it comes. And voila! Our dough, our bread dough. So now what are we about to do? Now it's time to shape our bread. I'll be making a batard, which is this oval kind of bread, which is the best sandwich bread because you can get even loaves when you cut it, okay? So you can make an excellent sandwich with it, okay? So what do I do? I fold first this side into the center and then I'll fold the second side on top of it, like this. This way we are giving tension to the dough and it's almost beginning to look like a bread, right? And now that I have it this way, I need to roll it like, like a sushi roll, <laughs> without degassing it too much. See how gently are my moves? And that's almost done. Ready, and look at all the bubbles that we have. This, is, this means that we have a very good fermentation. Now, what do I do with this? I will just pinch it like this and make like a stitches, like a stitch, okay? This way, now do this on the other side. And this will help the bread to have a better shape and to be, the gluten will be stronger, that's why. At last, we have to put some flour or semolina on top of it. <clears throat> this is going to be the crust of our bread. But to help it keep its shape, we'll be putting it in a banneton, which is like a bread form, you could mold, it's like a bread mold or broth form, they also call it, or banneton in French. So, I put some more semolina or flour in it and take a look at this. I'll flip it, I'll flip it like this and boom! This is the bottom of the bread and the crust or the future crust of the bread is now upside down. So slowly the bread will fill up all these bannetons and don't, don't worry if you see it smaller. Don't worry, the bread will fill all this banneton. But how and when? Well, what Gluten Morgan recommends you is to make a long and cold fermentation. How? In your fridge, okay? So that's what I'm going to do. I'll cover it up with this and I'll take it into my fridge. So I'll put it in the fridge at five centigrade degrees 
and I'll see you tomorrow. Good morning, with Gluten Morgan you don't have to wait that much. So, we're on the next day, so it's time to bake. Here I have the bread that I brought from the cold fermentation from my fridge and see how it has grown slowly at night. And here I have already preheated my oven at 250 degrees. Here you'll see it at Fahrenheit too. My cast iron pan, which will help me to bake the bread inside of it. Why? Because and all the water that's inside this bread dough will evaporate and help the dough to grow and to develop inside this cast iron pan, okay? Some more semolina as usual, so the bread doesn't stick on it. Some more semolina here on the bottom. Remember, this bread is upside down. And now I'll flip it. Ooh, wow. And will help me to make this cut along the bread. So this inside this cast iron will open up and make, I hope so, a beautiful ear. So let's cover it and I'll take it to the oven. Here you go. Bye bye, be the gluten be with you. And I'll see you in 20 minutes. And it's time to open this cast iron now. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> Good, yeah? Okay, but it's not yet finished. I still have to bake it and make it golden in more or less 24 minutes. Let's take it again to, into the oven. And there it goes for another 20, 25 minutes. Maybe 20. We'll check the color. In the meantime, okay, turn more. And finally, here woo, is our bread. Ah, this is very, very hot. That's why I use these gloves. And let's ah, hear this. Ooh, whoa. <laughs> okay, I let it cool down and then we'll cut it. So here's the bread ready. It's already cool. So it's time to analyze it, okay? Here we see all these blisters which are produced by the cold and long fermentations and they are really beautiful. And we have this ear which is very characteristic of this kind of breads because of the contrast of temperatures that we had. We took this bread out of the fridge at 5 degrees and then we baked it at a very high temperature. So this is the result of a very good fermentation. And here it is, the crust. Now it's time to open it and check out how is the crumb, okay? Wow, look at this beautiful and open crumb. Full of air, super light. Wow. Oof, and it smells super fresh. So now you know how to bake this kind of bread at home. And here with you, the recipe. As you see, it's very, very simple, and we only use this little amount of sourdough starter. What we need is strong flour or bread flour. The other flour that we'll be using is this one, whole wheat flour. If you don't have whole wheat flour at home, it's okay, use just regular white flour. Another ingredient, salt. We could have used it in any moment. I'll be using it right now, but that's not a problem. And the last two ingredients that we need is, of course, water that I'll be adding in a few minutes and our sourdough starter. So I need to get this sourdough starter from the bottom of this jar. Just one little spoon. And this is all that we need. There you go. That's all. <laughs> Very, very easy. Water time. We only need to mix all the ingredients. I just want all the flowers to get wet. And that is all. Now, very slowly, I'll start mixing. And that's all. No mess, no worries, nothing. Really, really easy. And that's all by the moment. We'll leave this dough here on the counter for one hour. And I'll come back. And let's see what's going on. Okay, it's been an hour and let's check out how is our dough. 
Time to put the hands in the dough. First of all, just a little water to wash my hands. This is an easy way for not sticking the dough in our hands. Let me check this and look, it's just a little bit kneaded by itself. Here is some gluten development. Wow, excellent. That's what we need. So what am I going to do now? Just a few foldings on the dough. That's all that we're going to do now. I'll cover it up and we'll return here in one more hour. Okay, one more hour is gone. It's been two hours since we started the no kneading method. So let's check how's our dough. So I'll pick the dough here from the bottom and let's start stretching. Oh, -ho. Mm. I'll cover it up and leave it here at room temperature until tomorrow. More or less, it's going to be like 16 hours. That's all. See you tomorrow. Good morning, everybody. It's a new day and I want you to see the dough which has been fermenting at room temperature for more than 16 hours. Look at all these bubbles in here. It's the gluten magic. With this little amount of sourdough starter. And that was all. Okay, time to shape this bread. So I have some semolina flour here and I'll put it on the counter so the dough doesn't stick on it. Okay, so let's put it on the table very slowly. Come and check this with me. Look at this dough. It's full of air, super bubbly, and we haven't done anything. Only just a, a few foldings, a little bit of sourdough, and this dough is incredible. Okay, but before we shape it, I have to prepare my banneton. I use this kind of banneton, these baskets, in order to the bread not to lose its shape, okay? Because it will be here just sitting like one or two hours. Okay, time to shape it. What I'm trying to do now is to give the bread some tension so it doesn't lose its shape, okay? The dough feels so incredible. I'll do some stitches here. And now that it's already shaped, I'll put some more semolina flour on top of it. Let it rain. Time to go into the basket. Always when you use this kind of baskets, you have to flip over the bread, okay? So, I'll cover the banneton and leave it here at room temperature for another one or two hours. In the meanwhile, I'll clean all this mess. And you can see, how's the bread? It's been two hours sitting on the basket and it's almost ready to be baked. Full of air, super fluffy, super huge. So I've, uh, I have the Dutch oven inside the oven, which is preheated at 250 degrees. The cacatua will tell you how much Fahrenheit degrees are, okay? So let's take it out of the oven and let's bake this bread. Oh, wow, it's really, really hot and it's very, very heavy. Okay, let's go. Some semolina flour on top of the bread so it doesn't stick. Here's some too. Y andiamo. looks beautiful. Scoring time. When we are waking with bread at room temperature, it's scoring is not that good. That's why I prefer always cold fermentation. Let's go into the oven. 20 minutes. Back to the oven. Okay, now it's time to take the bread out of the oven. You should look at it, it's beautiful. And here it comes. Come and look at it. Wow. It's super, super heavy. Wow, wow, and crunchy. Wow. Let's open it up. Give it a try. Mm, you must be thinking if it's too acid, but it's not. 
Have you ever ended up with a dough like this, a sticky dough? Okay, today I will show you how to work with this kind of dough. I'll show you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, earlier I got one kilo of strong bread flour. I mm -hmm. use uh, English flour, Wessex meal. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, just, just bread flour. Yeah, strong bread flour mm -hmm. is fine. Okay. Um, I got 20 grams of fresh yeast. Fresh yeast. If you have dry yeast, use dry yeast yeah. and sea salt. I don't use table salt, always sea uh -huh. salt. Okay, so in it. Sea salt. Okay. Very simple. And I say that don't, you don't mix yeast No, and not, salt. not to start with, a little bit that. So mm -hmm. that's the method I use people. Then I think a bit, I always cover my salt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then the yeast in here, I keep it very simple flour and rub it. Great. Just that. Then mix everything together. So I got in here, I got 720 grams of water. That's a uh, hydration of 70%. 72. Mm, 72. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I put my water in there. On books, many books or you see it on TV, people put their hand in there. Never do that. You, people don't like it to stick. So why putting your hand in there? Okay, so. What, what will you use? Uh, so what you use? Ah, cornet. Scraper. Corn in French or scraper? Cornet. What's in French? Francais? Corn. Cor cornet. Corn. 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 Without tea. Without tea. Corn. Okay. And this in here is ah. mine. See? Ah, yeah, I'll give you one after. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this in winter is very good for the windscreen for your car. <laughs> Take the ice out. Or in your in your in your bathroom, you know? Just <laughs> it's very so useful. One thing I teach people is when you mix dough, your yeah. power in, in your body, if you look at the mixer, the power is not on the door hook. The power mm -hmm. is from your core and your legs. Mm. Okay. So if you put your body like this and there, it will not work. Mm -hmm. You got to have one foot forward, one back. Your left hand becomes your, your kind of uh, yeah. engine. engine. Your right hand is your dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, and your whole body is got to work. Okay, so if you go rowing on the boat, you don't use just your arms. Yeah, you use your whole body. So, what I'm doing there is bring the flour. And that's what we call the frasage. Frasage, yeah. Okay, blending your ingredients together on the mixer, four or five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, in speed one. So at that stage, you realize if you miss flour, if you miss ingredients, you can always correct your mm -hmm. dough at that stage. But you, keep and you added clean. all the ingredients, the salt, everything at I, the beginning. When I teach people, I mm. do that. Then you can put the salt later and everything. Mm. But keep things simple to start yeah. with. Yeah, Very it's simple. Too complicated. It's, always. You can start making things too complicated, too many steps. Mm. You know? Yeah. When I teach people, when I describe my, my, my teaching that you have a filing cabinet in your head. You know, that's a filing cabinet. And in your filing cabinet, there's little drawers. Mm. When you bake, you got to have the same routine all the time. Mm -hmm. If you miss one draw, you pay two steps later. Yeah. So always go at the same method. Good. Okay, and say your method out loud before you do it, mm -hmm. and they will make it. So I'm bringing all the dry to the top. There's an obsession to go too quick on the table. The more work you do in the bowl, yeah. it's clean. It stays where it is. And you can move with the bowl too. Yeah. <laughs> you have to. Have a go. Okay, so. Ah! Blub. Next step is what we used to call decoupage. Lifting a mm. big lump of the, of the, of the, uh -huh. of the trough. Then we're going to slap it on the table. Passage en tête. It's like a kind of stretching. Slap it. And slapping. So, first part is this. Okay, so move a little bit. Thank you. Arms <laughs> like this, yeah? Yes. Not like this. Uh -huh. and so, the, the twin arm mixer mm -hmm. was created doing this. It's the same. See so you there. You leave the dough up. Mm. You slap it. Slap it. You stretch it over the top. Mm -hmm. And when you tidy up, it's what I call taking the dough for a walk. Walk the dough. Yeah. To make some kind of surface. Exactly. Mm. So one thing I teach people now is if you want to understand the language of the dough, you've got to understand two things with the dough. The most important thing in making dough. The dough has got two sides, the top mm -hmm. and the bottom. the bottom. Never mix it up. Mm -hmm. So never do this. Yeah. It Leave will become top sticky on again. Top. Yeah. So if your top is on top, moving your legs, then the dough doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. And you can start again. And there's a lot of stretching. So now a lot of people copy my technique and they do this. So their body is there and they just do this. Yeah, and then That's a lazy way of doing it. Mm. Because you know, 
your you're hand, not stretching. you're not stretching it sideways. Yeah. The stretching sideways is telling you when the door is ready. You're not turning it. You don't, you turn it at the end, right at the end, mm. to tuck it in. At the beginning, you use the stretchiness yeah. to give you the extension of your gluten. Yeah, I understand. If you take your hand away from the door, it doesn't work. Keep your hand on the door all the time. Okay. The worst part is over. What do you mean worst part? The best part. <laughs> worst part. <laughs> You wait oh, for this me? one. You, yeah. wait, you wait for this one. Oh, we're gonna have great fun together. <laughs> the worst part. That's nice, isn't now it? Now coming the worst. People are gonna be put off now. <laughs> what do you mean the worst part? People travel all over the world to come in here. You call it the worst part. No. <laughs> Don't cut. No, put it on. That's table. <laughs> I'm supposed to be advertising my class. Not put them off. Jesus. So now the best part, while well, I finish my coffee. No, no you finish coffee now. Look, it's lunch time. <laughs> now it's wine time, my friend. Oh, one second. Okay. White or red? Uh, surprise me. Uh, try with red, uh, white okay. first. And in the meanwhile, I want to give you my humble sourdough bread. Wow. Now you should learn some Spanish. Oh, that's going to be very hard. I'm good with dough, but language <laughs> of the... That's good. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a pleasure to, to have me visiting your kitchen here. Thank you very much. Sante. Sante. Cheers. Right. Oof. Mm. Oh. We should have started with this. No, because it <laughs> don't get worse. <laughs> Let's take some bread. Hi, I am Gluten Morgan and I am at the Gluten Morgan Lab Barcelona. Today is pizza day or pizza evening. So I'll give some tension to the dough with my hands and now I'll finish it like this. And now what I have to do is to take them into this container. It could be like this one, a small one, a bigger one. So the key to the perfect pizza is to let them rise slowly in the fridge. And of course I have many dough balls already prepared. Don't lose the air on the border which is the cornicione. This is the characteristic of this pizza, the Neapolitan pizza, which has this beautiful crust on the outside. Beautiful tomato sauce, Italian tomato sauce on top of a pizza. Now some sea salt, some fresh mozzarella. I'll cut it up with my own fingers. There they go. Some more there. Yes, now I'll shape it again a little bit. Oh, it, look, it looks beautiful. Let's go. Ooh, it's hot, eh? And there she goes. Look at the pepperoni. Ooh. It's losing all its fat, that tasty fat. And see how fast it goes. Let's count to five. One, two, three, four, five. And here. Wow. And turn it round. Wow, look at all these dots. This leoparding. Ah, I love it. Now let's go inside for a few seconds. Take it out, it's time. Wow. Wow, oh, it's bubbling. Beautiful color. The pepperoni is, oh, you should smell this pepperoni. Oof. This is Spanish pepperoni. Beautiful, okay. Here is the pizza. Look at this crust. Wow, really crispy. Let's check the bottom. Perfect. 
beautiful, beautiful pizza. And now let's cut it. Oh, listen to that crust. Oh, I just can't wait to taste it. Whew. This is awesome. Take a look at the cornicione. It's only air. It's just air, air, and nothing else than air. Risen a lot. Whoa. Some semolina on our counter, or you could use also flour if you want. And let's Take it out of the bowl and we're ready to divide it. In this kilo, I have four pizza balls of 250 grams, okay? Very easy, we'll take all the sides into the center, giving a little bit of tension to this pizza ball. We're making some stitches here and then we flip it and finish it with our hands giving it the final shape, a round shape, like this. Okay, I'm ready to take them to my fridge. The temperature in the fridge is around five degrees centigrade, that's around 41 degrees Fahrenheit. One or two days, see you. Okay, here I'm back with the dough. Ah, I know you're wondering if I waited two days. That's the magic of the addition. So here are the pizza balls already fermented, ready to be Bake. Let's bake some pizza. Let's give it a final shape, a round shape, and we are ready to stretch it. The first of all, we need to make the cornicione, which is the crust of the pizza, full of air and very light. So let's make the limit of this cornicione ready, and now we are ready to stretch it. See how easy it is to stretch this dough because it has rested a lot in the fridge in this, during this slow and long fermentation. Of course, the flour that we use, this Neapolitan flour, helps a lot. Okay, it's like painting. A very important Italian ingredient, the basil, or basilico in Italiano. If you leave on top of the pizza. Third ingredient, mozzarella. I am using this fresh mozzarella, made out of buffalo milk. See the strings that, that this mozzarella has. That's the mozzarella for this kind of pizza. A few pieces, not too much. That's the secret in this kind of pizza. Remember, not too much cheese, okay? Um, that's okay. And the last ingredient, olive oil. Italian olive oil, if you have. The idea is to make a kind of whirlpool here, like a spiral. Ooh. Good, perfect. And now let me get my peel. Whoa! Some semolina on it. Not too much. Just a little bit. So the pizza doesn't stick into the peel. And may the gluten be with me. Oh, 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 good. Let's finish the shape and I'm ready to take it into the oven. The oven is already preheated at 450 degrees centigrade. That is around 852 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really, really hot. And there we go. And back into the oven for a few seconds. And 
and time to take it out. Wow! Let's take a look at this beauty. Here the cornichone. Crispy and soft at the same time with these little charcoal dots known as leopardine. That was produced by the high temperature in which we bake this pizza. So let's cut it and see the cornichone. Wow. And take a look at this beautiful pizza with this airy cornichone. Super thin, crispy, and at the same time, a little bit morbido, like they call in Italy. And you eat it like this, folding it. It is called the fold pizza. Napolitan pizza, margherita. Let's give it a try. Mm, I love this kind of pizza. It's so simple, so delicate, and at the same time, really, really tasty and savory. This is our pizza base, ready to go with the tomato. Isn't it beautiful? Just tomato, Italian tomatoes. To be more specific, San Marzano. And that's all. Tomato on our pizza. It's a very, very simple pizza. By the way, the pizza that I'm making, it's a margarita, one of the classics of a Neapolitan pizza style. It's only the pizza base, tomato, some sea salt flakes, and don't forget the cheese. This is Fior di Latte. It's a, like a mozzarella, but super fresh and milder. Not too much. That's the difference between the other kind of pizzas that you're used to. This pizza just take the right amount of cheese because you have to taste the dough, the tomato, the cheese, the olive oil, and also the basil. This is very important. Basil leaves on the pizza. You can put it then before or after the oven. I like to do it before baking. And what else do we need? An excellent olive oil. Dun -dun. And that's all. Pizza ready. Ready to go to the oven. So I take the pizza peel with some more semolina on it, not too much. And now let's move the pizza. Oh, just in a second. Let me finish it. And we are ready to bake it. Come with me. This pizza oven is preheated at 450 degrees. That's a lot of heat. And this pizza should come out of the oven in more or less a minute. Let's go. Okay, see how fast it's baking and now it's time to turn it wow look at those dots on the dough wow and we're out wow beautiful let's go hope you have enjoyed it as much as i mm. Mm. so you don't know how much time do you need to ferment your bread maybe on the same day maybe on the next day or even two days. Stay watching this video and I'll show you how to do it. Here's the recipe of the bread that we are going to make today. Remember that you can upload this recipe into my app, Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage. It's totally free and you can download it from the app market of your Android or iPhone phone. It's been an hour. An hour though has been doing autolyze all this time. So let's check how it is now. And so what do we have to do now? We have to let it rise as I told you before. And the secret is to do it at room temperature. But which room temperature is the correct one? Let's check it. Okay, We're around 24, 23, 25. That's a good temperature. And Fahrenheit is around 77 degrees. By the magic of the gluten, it's been four hours and the dough is already fermented. Look, it has doubled in size or maybe tripled in size and it's beautiful, all full of air. Time to shape the bread.
All right, bread shape. And now comes the moment that I've been waiting for. And this is the key, the moment of the experiment of all this whole video, the fermentation. So now the experiment will be divided into three parts. The first one is going to be this first bread, the one that we did at room temperature, and we'll be baking it and see what happens. Then I have already fermenting in my fridge, that's a cold fermentation, a bread which I did 24 hours ago. This bread has been in the fridge for 24 hours. And I also have another one that I did it two days before, 48 hours. And this one has been in the fridge for two days, 48 hours. So now comes the epic moment. In we are going to bake these three breads, the room temperature, the 24 hours cold fermentation, the 48 cold fermentation too and see which are the difference. Okay, time to check if the bread is ready to go into the oven. One thing when we are baking bread at room temperature is to check, to make this poking and when it comes back slowly, takes a sec approximately, that means that the bread is ready. So, let's start this experiment. Here are the three breads. The first one, which was already done at room temperature, here's the 24 hours in the fridge and the 48 hours in the fridge cold fermenting. And another thing that I want you to see is a difference in volume. The first one, the room temperature bread, looks a little bit bigger, but it's not. The three breads weigh the same weight, which is one kilogram. But the difference between the cold fermentation breads and the room temperature bread is that the gases inside these two breads, the cold ones, they have compressed. So that's why they look smaller and this one looks bigger. Now it's time to bake them and continue with this experiment. At first sight, what we see is the opening of the year. The oven spring was better here and even better on the 48 hours. For 24 hours, okay, but this is normal, this happens all the time when you bake a bread on the same day. That's why, or one of the reasons why we cold ferment the bread of the shape is because when you cut it, you make a, a very, a better cut and the, and the bread opens better or bigger. The ear is bigger when you can do this perfect cut in cold fermentation. When you do it in a, in a dough which is at room temperature, the cut that you do, the, the scoring that you do is not the best. That's the, the thing, but it's okay. This bread is light, it's well baked, well fermented. And the color, another thing that I see, it is not that dark as this one. These are golden brown, like caramel. And this one is golden too, but not as much as this too, but it's, it seems to be perfect bread. And it's a little bit <laughs> hot. Now let's move on to the 24 hours. And here we have the 48 hours. What we see is a beautiful ear, nice, scoring nice, a good, a good uh, oven spring too. It is light, it sounds okay. That means it's well baked. And the first thing that we notice are these blisters. All these blisters are produce of cold fermentation, which are totally different which this one. Here are no blisters on the room temperature and on the 24 hours we start seeing some blisters. Beautiful bread and a little bit hot. <laughs> okay, time to move to the third one, the last one, 48 hours and that's a lot. You cannot always achieve 48 hours fermentation. It depends a little bit on the kind of flour that, you, that you're using. I've been using this a strong flour and also the temperature. You've seen that, that this cold fermentation was done in a very low temperature. And what I first see more than this ear, this, this ear is, is a little bit bigger, a little bit more open. What it's calling me are these blisters. We have much more blisters than in 24 hours. Check out in 48 hours. It's full of blisters. That means a long, long, long cold fermentation process. And it's beautiful too. Light, sounds okay. So what we still need to check is the crumb. But since they are really hot 
and it's not the best moment to cut a, and open a bread when it's hot because the crumb is not yet gelatinized. So what I would like to do, and since this is a video and video editing can do magic, why don't we let them cool down and we cut them tomorrow morning. All right, let's go first with the room temperature bread. Okay, but before I say something about the crumb, let's open the other two. Now it's a turn of the 24 hours cold fermentation. Let's open the last one. And this one is a 48 hours cold fermentation. So here we have the three breads already open and cool down. At first sight, what we see is, is that there are two buns. The side of the room temperature ones, and here we have the cold fermented ones. So, what we see on this one at room temperature is a crumb, which is not too dense, but it's perfectly fermented, but it's not an open crumb. Maybe you're fond of this kind of regular crumbs. This, these are ideal for sandwiches. When you use an open crumb, you can maybe get all your hand wet with some jam, marmalade, butter, or even olive oil. Now we move to the second side, the cold fermentation ones. The first thing you see is the crumb is totally different. This is an open crumb, total irregular, full of air pockets, smaller and bigger ones. That's good. That was not so good a long time ago in French cuisine and French bakery, but now I think it's my kind of crumb. I like to have this airy crumb. I know you can get your hand all dirty, but it's okay. So, the difference between the 24 and the 48 hours, the crumb seems almost the same. What it might have changed maybe is the taste. Maybe this one should be a little bit more acid because it has been one more day fermenting in the fridge. Let's try the room temperature one. I like this regular crumb. It is airy, it is moist and it's very tender and soft. Okay. I gotta try this one. I really like this bread. It's okay, even though I did it just in a few hours, but it's a good bread. Moist, they are very creamy, the crumb is super creamy, but the taste is light. Light, it's excellent, I think, for toast or a sandwich. Now it's time for the 24-hour bread. Okay, I'm really liking this kind of crumb. It is a little bit more soft and tender because it's full of air and the air pockets are bigger. I think it's because of that. And it's really moist, even moister than the first one. And a little bit colder. Okay, let's try it. Mm -hmm. It is really interesting how different the chewing is between this one and the first one. It is easier to eat this one, to chew it is, it is even moister than the first one and also the taste. The taste, now I see some little notes of acidity, but it's okay, it's not too acid. I always work with my sourdough starter, low in acidity because too much acid on a dough, it's not good for the gluten network. So that's what I usually do. I'm more used to this kind of bread. It is really tasty. The crumb is super creamy and humid. I'm loving this one, but I need to try the third one. And the last bread of the day, the 48 hours cold fermentation. Oh. <laughs> As before, the crumb is so moist and so tender. It is very, very fluffy. I'm liking this. And the crumb is thin, and the crust is also very thin, and that's another thing that I like a lot. So let's try it and see what it happens. Mm. Mm. So here I'm noticing something that I thought that it was going to happen. Acidity. It is a little bit more acidic 
as this the second one the 24 hours it's okay it's not too acid remember i said that i use a low acid sourdough starter so it's okay maybe if you're a fan of this acidic much more french kind of bread this could be your kind of bread the crumb is creamy soft and tender it's okay just a little bit of acidity so this is the end of this incredible experiment that i always wanted to do but i never did it till today i always did breads on the same day i also did 24 hours cold fermentation bread too and even 48 and also 96 but not at the same day so i think it's a, an interesting experiment and we discover a lot of things for example on this one on the bread done on the same day at room temperature what we found is that we can make an excellent bread not too strong in, in taste the, the the crumb is okay it's a little bit more regular no big pockets but it's a perfect bread to be done on the first day maybe if you are starting now with sourdough starter maybe this could be your kind of bread with no long fermentations cold fermentations it is easy you can do it on the same day so it's perfect bread for you now my favorite 24 hours bread this is the one that i always do here at my lab it's a perfect balance between acidity open crumb nice crust a nice ear it is beautiful from the outside or from the inside the taste is okay not too acid remember that i use always low acid sourdough starter so this is my kind of bread and that now we move to the third one to the 48 hour uh, long fermentation which is not too acid okay don't worry it's not that acid you can eat this bread perfectly but maybe it's a little bit more french style of bread they like more acid kind of bread. Do you want to know how I bake all these breads on the same day with one single dough? Stay watching this video and I'll show you how. So the three kind of breads that we'll be baking today are divided in three different levels of difficulty. The first one the, for the beginners it's going to be a chapata, a very easy bread to do. The second level will make this country loaf which is a little bit more difficult than the first one but not that much. And then comes the third level, in which it's a little bit more complex, more complicated, but not that much. And it's mini baguette. And what else do they have in common? I already told you that we'll be making just one dough. And this dough will be made or will be fermented with a poolish. A poolish is a pre-ferment made out of yeast, but a little bit of yeast and a little bit of time so let's start but first of all here is the recipe it is written in baker's percentage and you can use my app for iphone or android you can download it from the app store it's totally free first ingredient strong flour if you don't have a strong flour or high protein flour you could use bread flour second ingredient all-purpose flour yes the first flour that you have at home that one is perfect and now comes the star of this video, the Polish. Look how creamy and airy it is. It's pure air. Wow. Full of bubbles. Now, we add the salt and finally the water. We'll be pouring the water slowly, not all the water at the beginning. And let's start kneading. I'll be using the scraper to do this. We go slowly. Looking good. Just a little bit. And a few minutes later, the dough is looking like this. Now what we have to do is to leave it here at room temperature and let it rise. Double in size, maybe triple in size. Okay, see you in a minute. Okay. It's been two hours and here is the dough totally fermented. It has doubled in size and it's full of air and bubbles. So let's shape those breads. As usual, some semolina flour or just flour. Wow. Oof. Let's start level one, ciabatta. I think there's too much dough, so I'll cut the ends. One and two. 
The easy thing of the chapata bread is that it's so simple. We don't have to do much anything. Just cut this dough like it is and let it rest for a few minutes before we take it into the oven. All right, I let them rest on this board for a few minutes before I take them into the oven. Level two, country loaf. This is a very easy to shape bread too. This loaf is very easy to do and fast. We take one piece of the dough and we gently take it into the center. And we'll do the same and we are making some kind of stitches. Yes, it's like stitching a dough. So this is the bottom of the dough. Now we'll flip it over and with our hands we will adjust the final shape. Not too tight, not too loose, it's something in between. Now we put some semolina or some flour and we flip it again into the basket. Voila! Okay, I let it rest for 30 minutes before we bake it. Level 3, mini baguettes. It's very important to have this kind of rectangular dough. Now we'll give it some tension, just folding it into itself and pressing a little bit, not too tight, not too loose. The idea is not to lose all the air that's inside the dough. Now, again, the same on the other side and we'll do some stitches too here. It's a balance between tension and the loose dough. Again, almost done. Now we do the last fold. You can need some tension. Perfect. More. Go on. And we're almost done. Okay. The baguette is pre-shaped. So now I let it rest for 10 minutes and we'll do the final shape. Okay, so here is our baguette, pre-shaped, ready to be finished. The only thing that we are missing are the ends, the classic baguette ends. So, with two hands on the center, we start pressing not too much, we don't want to degas the bread, and then slowly we press a little bit more at the ends. And we have the baguette finished. Some flour, and we'll take it to the kush to rest before we take it into the oven. Baguettes already shaped, I let them rise for 30 minutes and then we'll bake them. Now it's time to transfer the ciabattas to the baking seal. It's pretty hot. Add the oven some water into this tray in order to make some steam in the oven. That always helps for a better baking. Time to bake the country loaf. Good, okay, I'll flip over the bread in the Dutch oven and make some scoring. This is very important. Now I'll cover it up again with the lid. Let's go to the oven. Look at the chapatas, they're beautiful. So now it's time to turn on the fan and let's remove the tray with the remaining water. Whoa. It's been 20 minutes, let's take the lid off. Whoa. <laughs> Back into the oven. Okay, 20 minutes more and we've got it. Heavy and it's hot. Time to bake the mini baguettes in this Dutch oven. I have the Dutch oven preheated at 482 degrees Fahrenheit and the process is very similar as the one of the country loaf. Some flour, the first one, perfect, let's go with the second one. Now some scoring and put on again the lid. Let's go to the oven. Whoa. Whoa. 
Uf. Uf. Zapatas ready. I let them cool down on this cooling rack. Cantaloupe is ready. Whoa. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Wow, take a look at this country love. Ooh. So, so light and so hot. Let's let it rest and cool down. Time to remove the lid and see how our mini baguette's going. Wow. They're looking gorgeous. 15 more minutes and we're done. Mini baguettes ready. Come and see them. Wow, and here are the mini baguettes. Oof. The smell is incredible. Let me check them. Oh, this is so hot. Ah. Oh, oh, light, light, ah, and hot, ah. ah let them go down. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Excellent crumb. It's moist. The crust is thin, crispy. Oh, I love it. And we did it in one single day with one single dough. Just a little bit of time, that's all. Mm. And let's try this. Oh, I love this chapata. It's so tender. The crumb is so moist, so fluffy. And the crust is so thin and crispy at the same time. You need to do this, it's beautiful. Maybe this is asking for some olive oil, prosciutto, some cheeses. Oh, beautiful. And here's the country loaf. It's so light too. And we did it in one day. It smells like being at the countryside. <laughs> and the crust is very rustic, super artisan. Check this caramelization, this color, beautiful. Okay, let's open it up and taste it. And check this crumb, isn't it beautiful? Done in one day, no use in sourdough, just a little bit of yeast, okay, we did a polish, we waited a little bit more, but on the same day. Oof, I need to test this bread. The crumb seems very, very tender and check out the crust, thin and crispy. Wow, let's give it a bite. Mm. I need some butter immediately. Butter please, at the first bite the crust is so crispy but then you feel the tenderness of the crumb. It's like biting a cloud. Oh, I love this bread. Mm. Time to check the baguettes. They are beautiful, so airy, so light. Check this out. Oof, so crispy. I need to taste this. Check these air pockets, they are so irregular. I just can't believe it. And we did it just in one day. One day, the magic of the gluten. I need to try this. The crust is so thin and crispy, and the crumb is so airy and light. Mmm, oh la la, I'm in Paris. Am I French? <laughs> I need some cheese, some French cheese. S'il vous plaît, les fromages, s'il vous plaît. I love this baguette. The crust is so thin, crispy, and the crumb so moist, tender. Ah, it's super French, super French. Ah, I really need that cheese. Mmm. I'll come back in a minute. Check this out. Four doughs, 
four different hydrations and all kneading at the same time. Amazing. I will make only one dough and I will only change the hydration of each one. So I'll start at 60% hydration here, then I'll change to 70% hydration, 80% hydration and 90% hydration. And these are the machines that I'm talking about. And the good thing about this kind of machines that they are super technological and they are connected to a computer which I'll be using to start them at the same time. And also I'll be checking with this timer how much time will they take to develop the gluten. That's the mission of today. Okay, this machine will handle the 60% hydration dough. Here's the sourdough starter. Okay, dough one ready, let's move on to the next one. And now comes the best part of the video, using the machines with this computer. Let's start the show. And now I will start adding the water in each machine. And then the 80 and the 90 hydration, I'll be adding the water very slowly. Now let's start the timer. It has reached the 26 degrees that it was programmed to. So now that this dough is ready, let's check the gluten network, which is really important to know if the dough is ready. Let's check the membrane. Wow, excellent gluten development in just a few minutes. And the other machines are still working. 15 minutes and the dough seems to be ready. Now we'll check the dough. Okay, let's check the gluten membrane of the 70% hydration dough. Wow. Take a look at this. Excellent gluten development. Ready, 56 minutes and 12 seconds. Okay, let's check the membrane at 80% hydration. Ho oh, oh. ho! Wow! Woo. Excellent! Gluten works! What? No! no. Oh, watch! It's almost done, I can't believe it. It took like an hour and a half of mixing, of kneading. Temperature is 26, 25.6, almost 26 degrees. <sighs> Mission accomplished. Oh. 94 minutes and 90% hydration dough, it's ready. Let's check the gluten network. Wow, this is awesome. Check this membrane, this gluten membrane, 90% hydration, almost like a kilo of flour and 900 grams of water. The mystery of the gluten. Okay, enough Pac-Man for today and I'm really glad on how this experiment came up to. The four doughs were finished, the 60% hydration was really fast, 70 uh, pretty fast too, 80 took a little bit longer and 90 took almost more than an hour and a half, a lot. But that was the idea of this experiment, to see how much time takes with different hydration. Of course it depends on the kind of flour that you're using, the machine, the temperature and the velocity of each machine. But it's interesting and it's something that I wanted to do for a long time. So I hope you've enjoyed, please follow the, me if you're not following me like this video, share it, and I'll see you on the next one. The chapatas I did it with 100% biga and 100% hydration. Stay here and see how I did it. So now I'm about to divide it and start shaping the chapatas. This chapatas, and it's really, really easy. You don't have to do much anything. Just cut the dough. Let's go with this first one. There, gently. I'll take this one. So, so light. We are ready to go to the oven. The oven is preheated very, very at high temperature. So here they go.
Let's make some steam. May the gluten be with them. Oof, if you could smell this perfume coming out of the oven. Ah, Italian perfume. Let's make a sneak peek. Woo hoo hoo! Still uh, seven minutes left. <laughs> Let's take them out of the oven. Taking advantage of the cold weather, now I have my chapatas already cooled down. Let's cut them. So take a look at this crumb. It is a little bit warm. I always do the same. I open the bread before it's time, before it has cooled down. That's not the be best moment to open because the crumb, it's not yet gelatinized. The, the, the crumb is still a little bit mm, chewy, but it's, look at it, it's incredible. So what kind of sandwich would you do with this? Maybe some mortadella, some stracciatella, and everything with ella. Wow! So, why don't we taste it? Mm. The crumb is really, really tender. It's humid, it's, but it's not chewy. It's, oh, it's quite soft like a butter. And, and the smell is everything. I could use this bread with everything, with a tomato, with, with fresh olive oil, maybe some stew, why not? Or some sausages, some cheese, oh, oh even alone. Mm. Would you like to know how to bake this bread here? Claudio Perrando will teach you how. Watch the video. For the old dog, it's like a direct dog. We need uh, flour, yeast, uh, salt, uh, water. Here we have and also oil. olive oil. It's optional mm -hmm. if you want it. Yeah. And we mix it all here in the container. Yeah, we mix all here in the container. We do some search and fold and we let it ferment then later until tomorrow. Uh, now, the second pre ferment, what we are doing is the sourdough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the classical sourdough. It's uh, uh, Levan. Levan, Levan. Levan, Levan mm -hmm. actually is a. Uh, an active sourdough. Yes. Now we have the active sourdough we have here. Uh -huh. And for the amount, what we need, we have to mix water and flour. Okay. Yeah. So we have flour and water. And the starter. The starter. The starter, okay. which is an active sourdough. And we mix first the flour with the active sourdough. Mm -hmm. And then we add the flour later. We will cover it and we let it ferment until it triples. Triples in size. Yeah, okay. uh, triples the size. Good. This is a goal. The last uh, of the three preferment is the Polish, the mm -hmm. legendary Polish. The Polish, we need flour, water, and a very small amount of yeast, which is between 0 0.2 and 0.5%. That's two grams per two kilo grams of flour. Two grams per kilo of mm -hmm. flour, depending how you want to ferment. Mm -hmm. You can ferment in a different way, three, four hours in room temperature, then you put it in the fridge mm -hmm. until next day, or you go only to 18 degrees with a with, uh, little bit of, of uh, yeast, mm -hmm. and you let it ferment. And 10, how much flour hours. and water do you need? It's always the same amount, the same mm. amount of flour and uh, the same amount ah, okay. of, of same water. Weight. The same weight, yeah. Okay. In the bowl, we start with the water. Yeah. After the water, we add the pot ferment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we let start. It. Yeah, we start mixing slowly. Okay. slowly. Yeah, during the mixing process, we will add now the polish. The polish. We are still mixing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and slowly, slowly, slowly mixing because the things are quite wet mm -hmm. inside. And then also a little bit later, we add the sourdough. The sourdough. To the, to the mix in the bowl. It's looking good. Yeah, and then it, the, 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 the dough will be quite liquid and here we start to add the flour. The flour. Yeah. Now it's looking more like a dough. Yeah, if, if it's, it comes together, it looks like a dough, then mm -hmm. we will add the this yeast. 
Yes, it's a little small amount of yeast. It's only a little, uh, little bit of amount of yeast. It's now we go with the sugar. We go with the sugar and then we try to mix uh, like 80%, 85% uh -huh. the dough ready and then we add the salt finally. Finally the salt. Finally yeah. the salt. Now it's looking good the dough, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, very easily I go with one part to the middle, with mm -hmm. the other part over it. You're doing some and stitches. Yeah, it's more and less like you mm -hmm. make at home with your shirts. And then I work it round, but mm -hmm. very smooth, mm -hmm. only to close it down. No pressing it too much. No pressing it too much. I want to let the air inside. Okay. Put a little bit flour on the surface and I put it in the in the broad form. In broad form, in, <laughs> Baneton. in Baneton, in the basket. I go over the skin, with the skin over the middle, mm -hmm. and I close it here. And then, with the skin, I go until the table. Mm -hmm. I push it a little bit down. Yeah. And now, the sticky part, I will ro roll over in the flour, mm. only the the dough will take what he needs that it don't stick anymore. Okay. Now you can see you have already the baguette. You uh -huh. can take it like this, but for aesthetic reason, we make the edges. Mm -hmm, the edges. Yeah, like it is. And then you can do this also at home or in mm -hmm. wherever. It's, it's, it's very either parchment paper, you put it on it Good. like it is. Yeah. And then you have the possibility to put it in the refrigerator for half an hour or 45 minutes to make the surface a little bit dry. The scoring will be much more easy. Yeah. And it helps also the baguette because now we have to slow it down. Hora de hornear. Let's bake.
Ooh, ho, ho. Oh. Excellent, Brett. Excellent, Brett. We love focaccia in here. Mm. Where I have in England, in 1990, people was, couldn't even even say the word ciabatta. Ciabatta. <laughs> focaccia in English, they, oh, they were too scared to say, fuck, fuck, no. focaccia. <laughs> yeah. so, Caccia, you, only caccia. Caccia. What? Fuck. What? That's so funny. You go, you go to a meeting with the supermarket and say, we want some furniture. <laughs> focaccia. The what? The, you know the Italian brand you start with F. <laughs> ah, focaccia. <gasps> no! <laughs> Incredible. And Shabata. Shabata. Oh, God. You know, it's... Yes. It was incredible. Is mm. it profitable to have a bakery in UK nowadays? No. No? I don't think so. Mm. As for the amount of work you put into it, it's very hard to make money. Unless you get the brand. You do it for your love, but I tell you what, love can become... I always see no. people who come in here to open a bakery. I, I said to them on the Monday, I would put, I'd do everything to put you off. <laughs> <laughs> because if you go for it and you do a success of it, well done. But it, 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 with bread... I see there's very little value in bread. Okay? Yes. The value is in your brand. Yes. Like many things. You know, people start with chocolate. There's so many chocolate brands. Why would you, as Mr. Nobody, become Mr. Chocolate? You've got to be clever on marketing. You got to, it's not just making good bread. You've got to have, you know, you can have 10 books behind you yeah. if you're not pushing or whatever. It's really, really hard. And there, are there bakeries, for example, that uh, get a freeze bread at the first uh, time of the day? And then they frozen bake it, bread. Fr frozen bread, sorry. And instead of baking and doing it by themselves, they buy it frozen and then they, they I'm bake I'm sure they will be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a, I think if you open a bakery, you've got to be smart. So you've got to understand the whole bakery system. You've got to be able to, to provide very fresh bread every time, every time, all the day. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand how dough works. You know, if I open a bakery again, I just mm -hmm. use cold dough. Mm -hmm. I would just use cold dough and bake it every hour. Yeah. Straight from the fridge. Yes. No problem. The concept to, to find people to work all night now, mm. bakers are different species. Yeah. Yes. So unless you work all night with them, which you can't do because you're, you're, you're crazy, to, you're able to touch them, inspire them to believe what you're doing, to do it the same. But, you know, human nature, we try to cut corners all the time. That's mm -hmm. a human nature. So I think... Unless you do it yourself all the time, but you burn out, you know. I could yes. never see myself working in the bakery for the next 20 years. I was just no chance. Yeah. So you got to find a method that you... I see the problem with many bakeries, they try to do too many things. They do 20 bread. <sighs> Why? You don't bake for yourself. You bake, yeah. for, you bake for yourself, you don't bake for people. It's just, you no, know, Mrs. Smith want one loaf of bread a yeah. day, you know, just... you. That you will lose money doing that. Yeah. You've got to simplify, make three good things. I always said to everybody yes. who opened a bakery, make three good things that people recognize you for. Mm -hmm. When I opened a bakery, I did three good things. A good focaccia. Foc what? Focaccia. <laughs> focaccia. <laughs> no. A good focaccia because people in England love a soft bread with olive oil. No. A good sourdough because it was fashionable. And mm. a good almond croissant. Uh, ah, almond croissant. No baguette? No, because baguettes with no chef life. Mm, yeah. So you've got to be smart. You know, mm. you've got to make things that, you yeah. know, if you make croissant, you can use them again. Yeah. Okay. So and I knew if I do those three good, then I have a chance. Yeah. And then we build up our bakery around those three foundations. Yeah. Stuff. All yeah. the rest came around it. Yeah. So Excellent. making baguettes, we made 40 baguettes a day. That's it. People don't buy baguettes like we do in France. Yeah. So what's the point of doing this in England? Yeah. They don't come in the morning and say, oh, I need my baguette at 6 o'clock in the yeah, morning. Yeah. Come it's back a fresh baked baguette. No. You know, they come on Monday. Mm. And come back on Friday. My guy was still yesterday. Say, yeah. It's Thursday. When you buy it Monday, <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> you know, so it's you've got to adapt to where you live. Yeah. Not make baguette because you're French. Yeah. It's stupid. You've always wanted to see the difference between hydrations 60, 70, 80, and 90. Stay on this video and I'll show you how to do it. And this is the Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage app. And this is a formula. 
And what is this 60% hydration thing? Well, 60% hydration means that is 60% the weight of our flour, the flour of the recipe. And this is the 70% hydration dough. And here is the formula too. And remember that you can download for free my application. It's for iPhone or Android. And now 80% hydration. Now we're increasing the amount of water. That means that in one kilo of flour, 800 grams of water. That's mm, complicated. And remember, here is the formula. And at least, but not at last, the 90% hydration dough. That's a lot of water. Ah, and don't forget the formula here. Okay, this is the 60% hydration dough, the first one. Go and sleep in his panetone. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Time for the 70% hydration dough. Put some semolina on top of it and I'll transfer it into the planet. And on the third place, the 80% hydration dough. <laughs> Put on some semolina and let's take it into the banetan. Okay. And I'm here with a 90% hydration dough. That's a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe it. This is incredible. The bread is still looking like a bread. So, some semolina flour on top of it, into the banneton. And here are the four sourdough breads that I took right out of the fridge. They're still cold and they're ready to go into the oven. Look, this is a 60% hydration, 70, 80, and 90. And as far as I see, they had a good night. <laughs> So, now it's time to bake them and to finish this experiment. Well, here I have the 60% hydration bread. And as you see, the volume is beautiful, perfect. It's an excellent loaf. This one, it's okay. Light, it sounds okay. 70% hydration, it looks okay. The volume is a little bit flatter than the first one because I waited a little bit longer when I took it into the oven, but it's okay, it's super light. We have the sear too, perfect. 80% hydration, looks okay too, super light, has an ear, a little bit flatter than this one, as I told you before, we did it all at the same time, maybe I should have taken this into the oven two hours before the first one, but the experiment was to do all at the same time. But it's okay. And now finally the 90%, the magic of the gluten. Look, it still has a good shape. It's super light, crunchy, and a little bit flatty, but it's okay. Okay, let's open them and see what's going on inside. Now that the breads are already cut in half. So this is the end of the experiment that you've asked me to do it. And well, these are the four breads baked at the same time, four different hydrations, 60, 70, 80, and 90. 
And that's all. So you want to know how to make this super fluffy and soft potato roll? Stay tuned on this video and I'll show you how. Today I'll be using my super dough mixer because I'll be needing, oh, it will be needing four kilos of dough. But here you have the formula for you to adapt to your necessities. Let's go with the flour. Now let's add the sugar, powder milk, the main ingredient, mashed potatoes. Now salt, fresh yeast. If you don't have fresh yeast, remember you could use one third using instant yeast. Turmeric for the color, eggs. And now let's add the water. So we have all the ingredients already integrated. Now it's time to add the butter. Dough is ready. Let's take it out of the mixer. Wow, the dough is beautiful. Nice gluten development. Here we have four kilos of potato dough. And now that it's a little bit stretched, let's go with this. Okay, dough stretch it. I think we have some like three or five millimeters. So I'm done. But this is huge. Cutting the rolls. Let's cut this in two. Let's start slicing it. The measurement would be just like two fingers, which is almost four centimeters. And we needed to do it gently, not pressing that much, so we don't break the roll. Here we go with another one. A lot, I don't know how many, but <laughs> we have a lot of rolls. When placing the rolls on the tray, try to leave some air between, so when they grow, they stick up together. And I do the same thing on this side. And now let's fill the tray. And now immediately we paint all the rolls with this egg wash. And I've done it with equal parts of egg and milk. It is really important to do it at the beginning, as soon as we, we've placed all the rolls on the tray. This way we'll protect the rolls from drying and we don't need to cover them up. Okay, egg wash ready. And now I'll sprinkle some sesame seeds. So there's nothing else much to do, just wait. We need the rolls to let them rise slowly and stick them all together. How much they have grown. Now we have the whole trail full of rolls. They're huge. So now it's time to bake them. I have my oven preheated at 250 degrees and they will be there for around some 20 minutes. Let's do it. And here with you, here are the rolls, already baked and almost cold. A little bit warm. But I love how fluffy they look like. Wow. Take a look at this piece of bread and the crumbs, so fluffy, so soft. Ooh, <laughs> I can imagine a lot of sandwiches that we could do with this thing. It's so humid. Oof, let's try it. Oh, it's even so good just like this alone. <laughs> the bread of today is an Italian bread. Maybe you might have heard of it. It is called ciapata. Yeah, ciapata. Typical Italian bread, which means in some dialect from Italy, like cashew. It's well, more or less like a shoe. And here is the formula. Remember that you can upload this recipe into my app, Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage. We open the oven 
and with the peel we let the chapatas slide slowly on the floor. Now I add some water with this vaporizer so the bread can grow and rise and a few ice cubes to generate more vapor. May the gluten be with them. Now that the chapatas have been in the oven for around 10 minutes, it's time to take them out with the peel and turn them around. This way, the baking will be more regular. Time to take them out of the oven. Take a look at this. Let's go with some gluten morgan sauce. And now the final touch, some smoked provolone. And back to the oven, really, really hot. Ooh, ah. Time to make that sandwich. Now the chimichurri. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? I told you to wait for it. So let's cut it and taste it. And as always, the best part of the video, tasting the sandwich. Mm. Uh, I'm talking about gluten. What is gluten? It's an issue that everyone is talking about that. We have on one side the lovers of the gluten and on the other side the haters of the gluten. So let me explain to you musical way. Oh, oh, not ready for the Grammys. Okay, let's go back to the bread. Okay, don't be afraid, I'll stop singing. But let me call my friend, the Dr. Mariana Kopman. She's an expert in chemistry and also in bread. So, Mariana, what is the gluten? Hi, Raymond. How are you doing? Well, what is gluten? Gluten is a net that is formed by two proteins that are present in the flour, but before you wet the flour, those proteins cannot link with each other. When you put uh, the flour with the water, what happens is that it's like start knitting a net between them. So there are unions and associations. Those unions are forever, but the associations are not. Thank you, Marina. Excellent explanation. But talking about gluten, just by itself, the gluten there in the air, it doesn't give the shape of the bread. There's something else. That's the gluten net or the gluten network. Incredible, that was the gluten network. So, I think it's about time that I sing you a new song about the... Ah, Marina is online. Oh, oh, okay, Marina is online. Tell us what is the gluten network. So, what happens when you knead and when you fold? You make those associations and unions. When you stop kneading on or when you stop folding, those asso associations relax. But you need to build a really good union and some associations to the end of the bread to keep the form so your loaf will be with a really really good shape. Thank you Mariana, as usual very precise and clear. Talking about the crumb, Mariana why don't you tell us what is the crumb? The marvelous thing about the crumb is that you can you build a very very good crumb thanks to the gluten net but not also the gluten net, 
but also because of the gelatinization of the starch. What does it mean? That when you heat the dough, the starch absorbs water, so part of it come out from the granule and when you, after the cooking and when it cool down, that part of the granule that, that goes off it can make another net that with the gluten will make a very, very, very good run. Bye Marina and thank you. So, okay, we've learned a little bit about the gluten, the gluten network and how to maintain our breads with a good shape. One thing that I want to ask you, since you've been traveling around the world and giving some classes, is it important to make the same recipe everywhere or you should be change around the world with the ingredients maybe that you find everywhere well, on each, in each different place? It's a, it's a really good question, Ramon, because I think that there's a movement right now amongst really sort of cutting edge bakers around the world where they are trying to make the most of their climate their grain, their, their history, and pull it back in. And the, though there are some great kind of um, sourdoughs, should I say in an American style mm -hmm, maybe, yeah. because there were some great bakers in, in America that really pushed this forward. I'm not as interested in, in that, and I'm more interested in how it reflects a society as it evolves and how it, yeah, you know, it um, resonates with people. Is that, is mm. that it's it. I, I don't want to see, you know, if I if I go French to, bread in Thailandia. No, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I I don't care. I mean, I I get it and I appreciate the craft, but I don't want it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, you know, if I go to, uh, uh, say to Venice, I'm not really looking for bagels. Mm, yeah. I mean, I know some people are, and that's. But even if, even if I was, I'd like them to use Italian flour, and I don't know, be, I don't know, maybe have, have some rosemary and some polenta. Or I'd, I'd like them to riff a little bit on being Italian. Mm -hmm. And I realise that that, that also means that I'm not, I'm not allowing people in that country to be be expressive, mm. and that's a problem. Um, but but certainly that's as a consumer that's where, probably where I'm coming from. Uh, how do you see the future of baking? Oh, I, I think I, I think I see the future of baking a little bit more uh, like I see it in in Southeast Asia, where people use smaller ovens, where uh, uh, less fuel. Um, so for home baking, I think. I think some of those really dark loaves might be a kind of luxury that we can't afford anymore mm. because they take a lot of energy to produce them. Mm. I think that we'll see less imported flour and we will be, be forced to rely on what comes locally. Uh, which for, is good. Which is good, yeah, absolutely. These things all have some good, yeah. good things to, yeah. parts to them. I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you want to learn more about sourdough bread and sourdough starter, I encourage you to check the link on the description. And remember, this masterclass was specially designed for you.